Okay, well, welcome. I'm Bob Johnson, one of the 20 directors of the Central Coast MIT Enterprise Forum. We are all volunteers, as you probably know, and we work very hard to put on interesting and valuable programs. We've been doing this in Santa Barbara now for 25 years, since 1984. In fact, last week I met one of the founders uh, who put this chapter together, and there's another one here tonight. Uh, Ken, where are you? Right there, the part of the founding group. There are 24 chapters in the world. Santa Barbara is the smallest metropolitan area that has one, which I think speaks to the vitality of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the Central Coast. People are always asking me, why, why does MIT do this? Um, and once in a while, I try to answer that. Um, since its founding almost 150 years ago, MIT's mission has been to develop science and technology and to put it to practice for the benefit of mankind. In a recent report, the Kauffman Foundation had done a study, um, reported that 110,000 living MIT alums were responsible for founding 26,000 companies that were still active and independent. That means they only counted the uh, companies that were still independent. So somebody like Digital Equipment or uh, Apollo Computer would not count even though the people that they employed are still obviously employed. These 26,000 companies employ 3.3 million people. They do over $2 trillion in revenue, and taken together, they would be the 11th uh, largest economy in the world. So there's this obviously a significant impact on technology and te um, technology transfer and the, the impact on our economy, and we all know that. That's why we're here. So it's really in, in MIT's DNA, and we have been promoting and supporting uh, entrepreneurship worldwide, um, basically what we call the entrepreneurial eco ecosystem. I think we all use that now. And we do it in several ways. We have a venture mentoring service which coaches uh, young companies, the Despande Center, which primarily uh, provides developmental grants for promising technology, the international development initiatives that are at work in a number of third world countries, the Enterprise Forum, which, of course, we're one of, and the Technology Licensing Office. Um, the process of technology transfer is a vital part of doing all of this. Um, and while the goals are simple, the process and the issues are very complicated, as we will learn um, much more about this evening. But before that, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our valued sponsors. Our event sponsor this evening is Berliner & Associates, an intellectual property uh, law firm in Los Angeles. And our annual sponsors are, uh, the premier sponsors are Riviera Insurance, Bank of the West, Radius Group, Commercial Real Estate, Nassif Hicks, Harris and Company, CPAs, Stradling Yoka, Carlson and Routh, Attorneys at Law, Vices, LLC, does a lot of web and um, um, database solutions. Uh, the Pacific Coast Business Times, uh, CIO Solutions, Express Employment Professionals, and our supporting sponsors are DuPont Displays, Alma Rosa Winery, um, Mission Ventures, and Newshawk. And we rely on them for a lot of support, which helps pay the bills and keep our ticket prices down. As you can see, we're videotaping this uh, program this evening. This is our seventh program that we've videotaped. These programs will be broadcast on Channel 21 a number of times over the next couple of months. To get the schedule, just go to uh, www.sbchannels.tv and click on the uh, Channel 21 tab and then click on the On the Air Schedule tab and you'll find. And they do some of them not at 3 in the morning, actually. There's <laughs> so uh, now I'd like to introduce Adam Jones. He's our moderator for this evening. Adam is one of our newest board members. He's the Associate Director of the Technology Licensing Activities at UCSB. He's a graduate of UCSB in Biological Sciences, and he's a graduate of the Harvard Law School. He worked for two major law firms in California before joining UCSB in 2008. So I'm really delighted that Adam has joined us and has put together this really interesting program this evening. Adam? Thank you, Bob. Uh, first, I'd just like to uh, welcome you all here and thank you for coming to the first program of the MIT Enterprise Forum in 2010. 
Uh, the topic for tonight, the title of the event is From University Labs to the Marketplace, Technology Transfer, Engine of Innovation. And it's essentially about technology transfer from universities. And we have four great panelists here who are experts, and I can't think of better people to have to explain this topic to you and to really get some good conversation going. To my right here, first we have Lita Nelson. Lita is the director of the Technology Licensing Office at MIT, where she's been since 1986. She is a world-renowned expert in technology transfer, and nobody knows it better. We also have Cheryl Mills Englander, the director at UC Santa Barbara, Office of Technology and Industry Alliances. To her right, we have Sanjeet Biswas, who is the CEO and co-founder of Meraki Inc., which is a spin-out from MIT. And at the end of the table, we have Rob Siegel, who's a general partner from XSEED Capital Management, who's a VC, which is a VC firm that specializes in university-based startups. So I'm going to first invite Lita Nelson to come up as our keynote speaker. She came all the way out from Cambridge, Massachusetts for this, so we're really appreciative. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lita. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, and coming from the snows of the east, I suppose I should thank you for inviting me to warm, sunny California. <laughs> My uh, objective today, tonight, is to do a little bit of background for those people who don't, aren't familiar with it, of what university tech transfer is all about, and then tell you more about how MIT is doing it, with a particular emphasis on um, our entrepreneurship and why, well, we've only been at it for probably 100 years, but why it seems to work in the Cambridge area, some of which is generalizable, I believe, to other places. OK, somebody's got to teach me how to do this. Nope. Can somebody help me? Which way is up, down, backwards? There. Terrific. The term tech transfer is a very, rather strange term in terms of it means how do you get things that universities discover and know out into the economic world, and of course there's lots of ways of doing it, perhaps the most important one being the graduating student at the state of the art that goes into industry. But what we're going to talk about today is the formal definition of tech transfer as it's used in the government and in universities and whatever, which is a purposeful transfer of specific results of technology uh, research into the economy via intellectual property. That is, it, shorthand, it's licensing mostly of patents and sometimes of copyrighted software. We know why we're doing it. We basically would go from research to inventions, to development, to innovation. A key element of that research, at least in the United States and actually for the rest of the world, is the United States government support of fundamental research at universities, without which this whole story doesn't mean anything. So why are we doing it? New medicines, new cures, new products, economic competitiveness by ensuring that technology is picking up new uh, uh, businesses, picking up new technology, encouraging entrepreneurship, a source of new job creation. I think that's come to be taken for granted. And of course, helping solving the big societal problems. The problems of energy and the environment are not going to be solved by current technology. Let me give you a background on technology transfer, this intellectual property transfer, a short history. Patent licensing out of universities went on, well, it started at MIT as early as 1930s, but that was rather unusual. There were a few universities, Wisconsin, MIT, one or two others. Between 1960 and 1980, there was some patent licensing, but not widespread. The big thing that happened was the Bayh-Dole Act, which I'll come back to again, which is accelerated tech transfer because it allowed the universities 
generally to own patents coming out of federally funded research. Following that, it took about 10 years for those universities who hadn't already been doing it, and some had, um, to learn how to do this, to learn that bilingual job between academia and industry. By 1990, about 10 years after uh, Baidol was passed, there were more than just a handful of universities who knew how to do it, and there began to be more and more of an emphasis on entrepreneurial spin-outs. By the late 1990s, Japan and Taiwan were putting in Baidol-like acts because they were seeing what was happening in Kendall Square in the Bay Area from university technology spinning out. And nowadays, you've got it in Singapore, South Africa, everywhere in the world, trying to copy the US systems. By about now, the interest, the interest in technology transfer is global, particularly on the part of governments, because they're seeing technology, entrepreneurship as a source of economic survival in the knowledge economy. And we get visited by dozens of people from probably 60 or 80 different countries in the last 10 years who want to learn how we do what we do. At MIT, our federal funding is pretty large. It's about 76% of our fundamental research, which actually is lower than uh, industry, uh, uh, university average. Why is it lower? Not because the uh, amount of federal funding is lower, but because the other fraction is higher. We've now got about 82 million a year from funded by industry and another almost 70 from nonprofits and foundations. So let's talk a little more about the Baidol Act and what it was all about. Most importantly, it gave universities the right to take title to patents arriving from, arising from federally funded research. Since on the average, that's almost 90% of their research, this was the tail that wags the dog. It allowed universities to grant licenses, enabling tech transfer at the local level, not at the central government level. It allowed exclusive licenses. Now this, we'll get into why this is so important in a minute, but that was key. This whole thing that you're seeing here is counterintuitive if you try to explain it to non-technology people. Why should the government that funds the research when everybody, the taxpayer, pays for it why should the universities be allowed to take royalties? Why should the professors be able to, inventors be able to take royalties? And why should they be able to grant exclusive licenses when the whole country pays for these technologies? It's counterintuitive. What happened before is the government owned the patents, Everybody could take a non-exclusive license, and there were drawers of dusty patents in Washington. Because, well, first of all, why'd they do it? They noticed the drawers of dusty patents. The uh, US was leading the world in basic research, but the research results were not being transferred into industrial innovation. At that point, this is the late 1970s, Japan was going to conquer the world economically, for those who remember that far back, and the U.S. was very, government was very concerned with economic competitiveness. They owned patents, but nothing was happening. So the Baidol, and by the way, this is quite remarkable. Uh, for those of you not old enough, Birch Bayh was a very liberal senator from Indiana. Bob Dole was a not so liberal senator from the South. Um, so this was a remarkable Repub uh, Democrat, Republican uh, law, which I'm not sure would happen today. The premise of the Bayh-Dole Act was why are, is it get troublesome to get industry to pick up inventions from universities? Well, the real reason is because those are, uh, inventions are half-baked, if you're lucky. It's the, they're embryonic. They're just enough to publish a paper on it. 
and neither their commercial feasibility nor the more innovative they are, their market feasibility. Who wants something they never heard of? If it's, they're going to reach the market, it's going to be a high risk investment. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money, and nobody's sure it's going to work. So the idea was the ability to use intellectual property protection to reward the first mover. If you, the company, instead of holding back to see if it's going to work along with everyone else, will come in and invest, make this high res risk investment, then the pat university's patents, exclusively licensed, will keep the other guy who is waiting to see if it works from coming in. So the tech transfer bargain is university research leads to patent. The university is willing to grant an exclusive license to the company who will commit to developing it. If de development exceed, uh, succeeds, the company is protected from the competitors. And the university benefits from the product being developed, which is probably, as we'll talk later, more important, the fact that we're getting technology out there and from royalties share with an incentive for the investors. What we find is the more, I think it's obvious, the harder it is to bring that product to market, the longer it will take and the more money it will take, the more important patents are. You're not going to get a new pharmaceutical being invested in without strong patent protection. But it's also important in the other very innovative technologies, superconductors, solar energy, batteries, not software so much, where the time to market is very short, but the really key innovative technologies. The university benefits from getting the technology developed. Something that people underestimate in the, is the importance to inventors of the ability to see their work being made real. I worked 10, 12 years on this, and now it's finally getting out into the market. And it benefits the students in that the interactions with industry are bringing real world problems into the laboratory. But does it make money? Here's something, here's some very interesting statistics. Most people tend to think that universities do technology licensing for the money. They don't. Or if they're trying to, they're not doing very well. Here's some statistics. This is 200 major research universities in the US and research hospitals. Almost 10,000 patents in a year, over 4,000 licenses, 11,000 licenses yielding income in the drawer, new startup companies over 500 a year. But the licensing revenue from all these 200 universities looks like a big number. $2 billion, but this is on a research base of $41 billion, meaning that after 25 years of Bayh-Dole experience, you're talking about 5% of your research base on the average. Not only that, but the, the revenue is completely skewed. This is a lottery if you're looking at it from the viewpoint of how much money are you going to make. Uh, it's dominated by a very few large royalties yielding 20, 30, even 50 million a year for individual patents. Almost all of them are pharmaceuticals. And it's pretty straightforward. If you're going to get a new pharmaceutical on the market, you're not going to start the project unless it's, say, 2 billion a year. That seems to be the cutoff for a lot. Even if you do a lousy job and have a 4% royalty, that's 80 million a year for 10 years. So if you get one of those, you've won the lottery. But statistically, you're not going to. Equity cash in from spin outs during the period of irrational exuberance, you would suddenly see the occasional, you know, even when the university's uh, share went down to less than 1% of the shares, you'd get 10 million, 20 million, even 50 million. But that was once. You're not going to see that again. What happens really is that most universities break even and occasionally get a little bit lucky, not a lot of lucky. 
Even on the lot of lucky, you'll occasionally hear that somebody got $500 million. Well, they didn't get $500 million. They had a pharmaceutical, a big pharmaceutical. They sold off the revenue stream. And that may happen once every three years. And fortunately, at MIT, my boss doesn't say, so why didn't you do it? But the societal impact's much larger. Uh, it's estimated that over half a million jobs are created in the development and production of new products based on university licensing, significant tax returns to the government, and of course, the real products, new medicines, new cures, whatever. And a significant number of new startups turn into real companies. For example, Google from Stanford. And one of my favorite stories in the late 1980s when we were just beginning to do startups. We licensed a little biotech company and it had a patent and it had a business plan and it actually got money and that was very nice and we had a little bit of equity. And time goes on and it ran into speed bumps and our equity got diluted down to homeopathic proportions. <laughs> Oh, we still had a patent. We could be getting royalties. Well, more time goes on, and uh, our, our technology wasn't working. But we had tapped into the irrational persistence of the good entrepreneurs, and they found something else to do. And Cubis Pharmaceuticals is now a 700 million a year company in Massachusetts. And if our job is impact, not income, we did our job there. This is an odd clicker. OK. Where if you look at the Boston area, we're a very significant contributor to the biotech clusters, to the, the IT clusters. From a software point of view, not a lot, because it tends to go out the back door. But from a technology IT, such as Akamai, et cetera, we're a very significant contributor. And certainly, if the federal support for clean energy keeps going, I think we're going to be a very significant contributor to the green energy cluster that we all hope is going to form in Massachusetts and is certainly beginning. Another major impact is entrepreneurship awareness at the university. We do enough of this that the students and the faculty are now very, very interested in doing it. At MIT, you know, we talk here business school curriculum changes somewhat to, this was before I worked for MIT and I went back as a Sloan Fellow at the MIT Business School. And I was very disappointed because I had grown up at uh, undergrad at MIT, joined my professor's startup company. My friends had had similar experiences and I go to Sloan and it's all about big business. Very little about entrepreneurship, whatever. But all that was going on in the technical part of MIT, the Great Dome part, meant that the students applying to the MBA program were self-selecting for interest in entrepreneurship. And they forced an entrepreneurship track at the uh, Sloan School of Business, which is now the most oversubscribed, largest track in the MBA program. OK. At MIT, a lot of this was general, although I'm sp speaking more about the MIT, uh, MIT. Patenting began back all the way in the 1930s. In the 1960s and 70s, MIT was part of a small group of schools that had an arrangement with the federal government very similar to what the Bayh-Dole Act did for universities in general. In 1986, the Technology Licensing Office was reorganized. It had been primarily a legal office, and it changed to be one with an emphasis, people with technical and marketing backgrounds. And we went from eight licenses a year to nowadays about 100, and an income of 3 million. I joined in 86, an income of 3 million a year, which the next year dropped to 1.5 million. How's that for? showing success, but we are now up to in the 75 million a year. Uh, I, I wasn't director when I came in at the time. 
We now get about 500 new invention disclosures a year, about 100 licenses, 50 to 30 new startup companies, even in, this, we're doing about 20 a year, even in this miserable climate, over 600 active licenses and more than 300 spin-outs. We're primarily about impact. What's the impact we can make on the economy? And as a result, our business strategy with these 500 invention disclosures a year is just about the opposite of what any business school would tell you to do, which is focus, focus, focus. Our strategy is the reverse, the volume strategy. Do a lot. Try to maximize the number of technologies being developed rather than pick a few winners. Why? Well, first of all, it maximizes the participation of the faculty. If we turn down 80%, 90% of what came into us, faculty don't like failing exams either. We'd get very few disclosures next year, and it would go down. It also maximizes the number of technologies being invested in, and it maximizes the probability of hitting a home run. Because the reality is the technology is so early that it's pretty hard to tell the cherries from the pits. We try to eliminate the ones that we think are pretty sure losers, but for the others, as many as we can get someone to give a chance to, we will do. You can see we seem to be able to keep going um, at the about 20 companies a year range. I mean, back in the year 2000, we had 30 startups. And then, of course, dot .com, dot .bomb, and et cetera. So why are we able to do so much? Well, we have a lot of research going on, you know, about 700 million a year on campus of research, about 600 million a year at Lincoln Lab, although the, not much of the technology gets, goes into the commercial world from there. We've got pretty high-ranking faculty who seem to be at the top of their fields. Consistent tech transfer policies. I'm one of the lucky people as a director of a tech transfer office at MIT. From President Hockfield on down, everybody knows it's about impact and that income is secondary. And of course, we've been at it a while and that helps. Another thing we get asked is, does MIT have an incubator? And the answer I give is, yeah, it's called the city of Cambridge. And that's what I want to talk about a little here which is the entrepreneurial ecosystem, both within and around MIT. First of all, we're well-networked in a highly entrepreneurial area. And then there's many activities, and I'll name a few of them, Bob did already, where the university and its students and its faculty are continuously exposed to folks like you, ex to experienced entrepreneurs, to uh, Invest, angel investors, venture capitalists, companies, etc. Some of them are the Dishpandi Center, where, uh, which is founded on a philanthropic donation from Desh Dishpandi, who's founder of Sycamore. And what's interesting, well, let me go back. What's interesting about the Dishpandi, well, I'll come to it a little more. We've got student business plan contest, venture mentoring service, enterprise forum, the entrepreneurship center at the Sloan School, about a, must be close to a dozen student venture and entrepreneurship clubs, some of them focused on energy, some of them focused on biotech, some of them more generally focused, some of them focused on social venturing and us. So let me talk about the Dishpandi Center. It was founded on a philanthropic donation from Desh Dishpandi, who was the founder of Sycamore and a couple of other successful companies. And in addition to it, it's competitive. It gives research grants to projects that look like they have potential with another year or two of research of spinning out. But that's the easy part. The money is only a piece of it. Most importantly, both in the judging of the projects, the business community is involved, and then each project, when it's funded, and it can be funded with an ignition grant for about 75,000 up to an innovation grant of about 250,000, between a year and two years total, 
Each of them is matched up with a, what they call a catalyst, which is an advisor from the business community who mentors the project. It doesn't mentor how to do the science. It's mentoring what are the questions you're going to have to answer before anybody's going to believe this has commercial potential. So it's a coaching uh, job. And there's also, each of the projects is matched up with a team from the business school not to write a business plan, but to look at this platform technology and say, what's it good for? It can do all these things. Where's the killer app? One interesting company, Brontis, started off, it was three-dimensional imaging. They thought it was going to be used in construction. They had a few other ideas. The I teams came up with dental. The professor would never have thought of it. They went into the dental field and sold themselves off rather successfully to 3M. The other thing that Dutch Bondi does is it runs a lot of parties. Wine, cheese, and sushi. What's the purpose of that? Each of these parties, poster sessions all around the room of each of the projects. So they're meeting with angel investors, other people who say, tell me what it's all about. And one of the functions of the Catalyst Mentor is to teach people how to do their elevator pitch to how do you talk to the real world. Another thing, another one where people get involved a lot is the Entrepreneurship Center at the Sloan School, where students intern with uh, CEOs of entrepreneurial companies. It's not the real internship where somebody goes and works for free. It's really a team of students working on projects and the projects have to report to the CEO or um, they don't get a team. Student business plan contest. We probably get about 80 to 100 entries with a surprising number of them that actually eventually get funded. But again, every time you see yellow here, it's where the business community is involved. The venture mentoring service. This started at two alums who had older alums who had made their money, let's say, and wanted to give back, asked the dean of engineering. Their idea was, we will act as mentors to any entrepreneur affiliated with MIT. Unlike these other projects that all have to have students or faculty, this also included alums. Started slow. It's now got over 100 volunteer mentors and uh, has done some very interesting things. The MIT Enterprise Forum of Cambridge, I don't think I need to tell you that involves the business community. So there's many more of these that I've talked about. And so often I get the question, who does it report to? How is the MIT entrepreneurial ecosystem organized? And the answer is it's not. In fact, it probably wouldn't work if it was planned from the top. Instead, it's a sort of it's truly an ecosystem. Somebody comes up with an idea, try it. If it works, it grows. If it doesn't work, it goes away, and another thing comes up. What's remarkable about the place, and Bob and I were talking about this while we were driving, is it's not organized. It's all these different entities. But the nice thing is it's mostly run by nerds. And the nice thing about nerds is they usually don't have political agendas. They're trying to get the job done. So the people are remarkably turf non-protective and collaborative with each other. So we all like each other and we just do it. And it seems to work. The interaction with the ecosystem of Boston Cambridge is interesting. First of all, we've been at it a long time. Uh, you can go back to Raytheon, DEC, Polaroid. They didn't have licenses, but they were coming out of MIT and helping seed the community. My first job as an under, when I uh, got out of MIT was my professor's startup company. If there's any biologists, it was Amicon. My husband, when he got tired of being a, a, a professor, uh, when he came out of MIT, he joined his PhD professor's startup company, which just happened to be Bose Corporation. Uh, but this is a long time. I mean, we're, this was decades and decades ago. So there's a very long history. And because of that, 
both because what MIT was doing and some other folks, an infrastructure developed of lawyers, accountants, consultants, real estate managers who understood small high-tech companies. Oops. A key component, and this is, was the angel investors. 25 years ago, we used to discourage angel, our faculty, angel investors, because they were the old kind of angels. The, what did you call them, the orthodontist angels? The people who had a lot of money but knew nothing about technology and they were tired of investing in real estate. Nowadays, we have the second, what I call the second time round angels, the people who made their money in the domain space, the high tech domain space in which they are now investing. And that means they're bringing tremendous experience along with their money. We got VCs who are experienced in startup companies. And what was really interesting is that 22 years ago in 87, when we started this whole thing, most of the money was coming from California or New York. There was very, even though venture capital started in Boston with American R&D and uh, very little startup venture capital in, in Boston. Then as we kept doing more, new funds formed and old funds like Venrock, for example, opened up offices in Boston. The other thing that happens over time, and it's time and a lot, is as I go around the world and people are trying to do this, the really scarcest resource is not money. It's managerial talent. It's experienced entrepreneurs who know how to raise small companies, how to manage them, and how to raise money for them. Most places in the world, they think a startup company is a professor and a grad student, and the professor is the president of the company, and maybe they let them do it in their labs, and there's no adult supervision, and those companies tend not to grow. What's lucky is that Cambridge, MIT, there are a few other universities there who do this also, which is attract the best and the brightest into the region. Then just by hanging around MIT, they're, tra uh, they're formally trained in technology but exposed to entrepreneurship, and then they become the talent base for the next decades. And probably the most important also is role models, continuously being exposed to it. You spend four years as an MIT undergraduate, whether you're interested or not, you're going to meet at least a dozen people who've started companies. So what happens is that students graduate with a sense of, one well, of these days I'm going to do that too, or maybe right now. So we call it an ecosystem because it's a complex, ever-changing collection of diverse organisms interacting with themselves in the surrounding environment, and that's how we see MIT, Cambridge, and entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. That was a great overview of technology transfer as a whole, and especially the entrepreneurial ecosystem around MIT and the Cambridge area. Um, our next speaker, Cheryl Mills Englander, is the director of the UC Santa Barbara Office of Technology and Industry Alliances. And she's going to take a more focused view. And um, a lot of people, when they're talking about technology transfer, tend to focus on startups a lot because that's what's exciting and people like to talk about them. Cheryl's going to actually address a different and unique structure at UCSB, um, the, sol the UCSB Solid State Lighting and Energy Center, and how we set that up and how it works. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Hi, and thank you to Adam Jones and to the uh, MIT board for inviting me to speak. It's an absolutely wonderful excuse to come out and meet more of our business community. And I'm embarrassed to say that my son takes a lot of my attention in the evenings, and I simply don't get out as much as I should into our community. Um, and I want to thank Lita as well. Um, it can always be a little stressful when another um, university comes in to share their experiences, but not only does she bring an incredible history and wisdom to the process, but I can honestly say UCSB's experiences and philosophies really echo what MIT is experiencing, perhaps 
We're about 10 years into their 30 years of growth, um, but we'll get there as long as we can, you know, keep our community footprint, the beautiful outdoor environment we are today. So what I want to talk about is the Solid State Lighting and Energy Center. While it has given birth to four startups, it is predominantly, the predominant focus on it is producing intellectual property and research that is going to make an impact both at the multi-billion dollar company level and at the startup level. But first, for those of you that haven't engaged our office, I want to just say a little bit about our office. Um, our mission, you know, much like uh, Lita's senior administration, our administration does get the uh, home run statistical improbability. Um, we need to conduct fair deals that make business sense, but our mission is to establish what I call long-term productive and effective relationships with industry. What I mean by long-term is we're not looking to squeeze every dime out of you in the one transaction. We want it to be beneficial to both sides so we can help nurture the commercialization as well as we can, as well as provide you with technologies that are going to make an impact. And by effective, I mean that it's going to be something that we're going to want to come back to again on both sides um, to do another deal. When we formed, we had the benefit of forming in 2005, which is when the historic decentralization of the UC technology licensing really came to a head and was transferred down to the campuses. Um, some of the bigger campuses already had an office, um, but it's when all nine campuses at the time took their technologies for local management. But what we did at that time is we realized that we work with our companies in two ways, predominantly as more of a legal office. We do research agreements when you want to support our research. We do licensing when you want to take out our technology and commercialize it. The skill set needed for both those transactions are similar, and it's a very different skill set than a federal grant, which is a lawyer I just simply couldn't get. Uh, they don't write out every last word the, quite the way we do. So there's a lot of art in uh, grant management. So what we did is we got a delegation of authority to both negotiate and sign research agreements and negotiate and sign license agreements in the same office. With that, we're hoping the companies will get to know one office well, and it, when their technology transitions to either to needing the other side of us, they already know who we are, they already know our philosophy, and it can be relatively seamless and one stop. We can also understand the corporate relationships much better, because other than philanthropy, we pretty much know how the company is engaging our campus, which helps us understand where your company is going, what you're going to need, as well as to factor in the historical relationship that we've already enjoyed. So we're really happy, because when, when I first did this business model, what I was hoping is for cyclical, where companies were engaging us in many different ways. Leslie Edwards in the back has also been active with an affiliates program that also can help you with workforce recruitment. And I'm happy to say at UCSB, 30% of the companies that support our research are also licensees of our technology. So I think we are actually able to get companies comfortable trans doing transactions on multiple levels. So turning back to what we call SLEC, and both those of you that know Stanford, there is a Stanford SLEC. So I don't want to confuse you. This is our solid state lighting center when I say SLEC. Um, the SLEC vision is using gallium nitride and other uh, semiconductor materials. How can we create energy efficient and low power for lighting, for displays? Your cell phones all have LEDs. Your flat screen TVs have LEDs. Um, generating power and renewable energy. And at the core of all these different market areas that we're looking into is gallium nitride and some related materials, which you may not know that UCSB, even back in the day when we were maybe a little smaller than what we currently enjoy as far as world impact, we were leaders in gallium nitride and indium phosphate. And so it's bridging into that, that early expertise and now taking advantage of its application to all these technologies. We were really blessed when in 1999, we were able to hire Dr. Shuji Nakamura away from Nichia. Dr. Shuji Nakamura is the inventor of the blue laser. And for those of you who are remembering those big 80s TVs, they had the red projector, the green projector, and the blue projector and voila, white light. So with the uh, development of the blue laser, we were able to do white LEDs, which really opened the door to l replacing light bulbs and to other lighting and display. We were also lucky to already have some of the leading experts 
in LED and gallium nitride already, which might be why Shuji decided to join us. And at the end of the day, we managed to build the largest solid state lighting academic effort in the world, and they are still the largest effort in the world. So the, the question came is, taking all of this talent and all this research with a huge potential to benefit society, how do we harness that and accelerate the transition from academia to commercial products in a way that's going to also foster better academic research? So we started with 11 corporate partners. Some of them are a little discreet. Um, these are the public members, Mitsubishi, Panasonic, Cree, Rome, and Stanley some of the largest providers of both end applications like TVs, car headlights and lighting, um, but also some of the component providers that actually provide the chips and the semiconductor wafers are also members. So we have a vertical integration approach from commodity supply all the way through to the end product members. We've seen a huge impact in the academic world we get an average of 9.5 citations per paper that comes out of SLEC, which for those of you that aren't in academia is actually well above average. And by citations, I mean when other scientists cite our work as a, a building point for their work. Now, the history of SLEC was, was very interesting because when we formed it in 2001, and, and I was around for it, we really expected it to run much like a normal research center where you might get one or two good inventions a year, and we'd be consider that a great job. So in 2001, we got our first membership. It was about seven. We were able to command a, get enough of a membership fee that the membership fee themselves fully funds our research. And that's very important because that gives us the freedom to carve the intellectual property rights back to the sponsor that's really needed to attract the level of funding we need to do this seriously. It started actually solely on gift funding at the tune of a half a million dollars a year. Um, we took an obligation that we would give courtesy invention disclosures to our member companies. It was a gift. There were no strings. Theoretically, we wouldn't have to give them anything. They would have no legal recourse. Obviously, they were the leaders in the industry, and we took that very seriously. And we started interacting on a gift level. And why gift? It's, it's an incredibly flexible sort of money for the university. So it allows us to really um, channel the research directions where academics needed to go as well as where the commercialization principles needed it to go. 2004 saw a little bit of a bump in the semiconductor industry, so we had to convert it. And um, what we basically did is we created an intellectual property policy for the center. So members in good standing get the intellectual property rights outlined in this policy. The interesting thing about it, for those that work a lot with universities, no contracts whatsoever. A company would give their membership, um, their annual membership fee. We would send a letter saying their members in good standing entitled to the intellectual property outlined on the two-page policy. And that was a total um, paperwork that passed between the parties. But we were all very aligned to go to the same place. And it worked very well. Part of it is um, we had companies from all, all different cultures. And not all of the business cultures were quite as wedded to the 50-page contract as the litigious society of the United States is. Um, but it, it became very nice because it's a seamless transaction where we can all focus in on the research. 2007, it became the Lighting and Energy Center instead of the Lighting Display Center to broaden our research scope. And by then, we had become a pretty big IP-driven center. So we needed to revamp our IP policy to accommodate the level of intellectual property that we were creating on an annual basis. And I'll switch to that next. And it's been wonderful. Since 2001, we've received 118 invention disclosures. As of today, 80% of those are under a licensing arrangement with one or more of our member companies. Um, before the little economy blip, it was 92.5%, but we're still very proud and it's still very much above average. Our re we average one disclosure for every 370,000 of research. The Economist in 2005 published an article where high-tech companies were cited as typically generating one disclosure for every $500,000. So we were running in an IP perspective more efficiently than the high-tech companies of 2005. In addition, we, uh, we had a lot of related technology, so we made sure that the uh, members were away, aware of another 52 related inventions that came from other funding sources, many of which were also picked up to complement the uh, intellectual property portfolio. So the way this basically works is the members all have the right 
to elect for either a non-exclusive or a co-exclusive license. They have a full year to review the intellectual property as it generates to interact with our researchers to decide if it's a good fit. And then once a year, there is an election period for all the, the preceding year's um, inventions. Like I said, they could go co-exclusive, or if they're the only one interested, it's an exclusive or non-exclusive. But if one or more company wants it exclusively, we don't take it outside that membership circle. We also had to put in place, particularly in the second generation, a subsequent access policy. Those of you in engineering knows it's incredibly hard in the beginning to determine whether it's an incremental improvement or a foundational one. And we became concerned that there were so many different technologies coming out that a company may not have 100% have um, predictive abilities. So we put in a policy that if they do pass in the election period and they don't elect to license a technology, there is a procedure that for, for a fixed period of time after they can actually come back and get a license. And then finally, you know, the, we, we also had to accommodate you know, great opportunities with the federal government, especially now in the alternative energy being such a focus and energy efficiency. So we also worked on a mechanism where we could accept federal funding into the center without violating any federal policies or principles. And that allows the uh, SLEC, the center itself, to leverage the membership fees with consistent and harmonious federal grants. As far as licensing procedures, there's a lot of details, obviously, but we make sure members pay the same standardized um, annual fees and royalties, uh, so everyone is treated the same. All of them share patent costs per rata, so if there are three, they pay a third each of the patent costs. And you know, one of the interesting challenges is sublicensing and um, patent enforcement when you're really dealing with three to five multinationals and perhaps a startup or two having uh, rights to the technology, uh, managing those rights gets to be uh, pretty challenging. So we had to work through a lot of procedures on that. So I would love to say that my office um, made Slack happen, but we didn't. Um, our researchers and their brilliance uh, gave us the market potential to create the center. Their consistent results creates value to the companies and to UCSB in keeping the center. But one of the biggest things I tell other, other uh, universities that are going to try to do this structure on a large volume scale is that really the key to this is the relationships between the companies and the researchers. Our researchers sacrifice a great deal to keep our companies informed. The companies all send, are entitled to send a visiting researcher to UCSB. Those of you know, that knows patent law will know quickly that Joint inventorship, if one member is a joint inventor and the rest aren't, can quickly turn chaotic. So we do ask all visitors to assign title to the university so all the members have the same type of access to all the different intellectual property, regardless of inventorship. They also get a representative to the board, which has annual meetings. We attend these meetings, and they're fascinating. We absolutely have the academic freedom to research whatever we want. But these are real dialogues between companies and our researchers on if you have various academic problems to pick, which ones are the real bottlenecks to commercialization? What are the real specs that need to be hit in order to be able to take it out from the university into a mass scale commodity market like LEDs? and they can attend an annual research result review. And then where the researchers at UCSB were do such a great job is every member, all 11 of them, get a minimum of biannual visits. And I have to say, these are researchers with kids and family, and they are on the plane to Asia, to Europe, to North Carolina on a monthly basis to keep that research dialogue going. And informally, they, average, they, they have told me they think they've shaved four to six years off the timeline from early stage discovery to product through these detailed discussions. So the academic researchers are free to research what they want. That's a very important principle. But they do so with continual dialogue and a lot of education on, on what's needed to make the societal impact we're all looking for. So that's the sum of the Select Center. It's probably one of our uh, largest IP portfolios at UCSB, so it's something to definitely watch and be proud of as a Santa Barbarian. And I guess we'll take questions after the uh, talks. Thank you.
Thank you, Cheryl, for the summary of Slack, and it certainly has been successful so far, and I know we have high hopes for the future. So now, uh, why don't we get to know our panelists a little better, uh, starting with Rob Siegel down there from XSEED Capital Management. Rob, can you give us a little background on yourself and XSEED, and um, in particular, why XSEED focuses on, focuses on university-based startups? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who don't know about XSEED, we're a relatively new venture fund. We're about three years old, and we invest exclusively in breakthrough technologies that come out of major research institutions, universities, national labs, and the like. We exist because what we were seeing in the venture industry was that as more capital came under management, uh, the venture industry moved away from doing traditional venture capital and we really became asset managers. And every, lar every problem, the solution seemed to be throw money at it, get big quickly, and that was not yielding the kind of returns to the LPs that had historically happened over the last 30 plus years. And in fact, what we found as we looked at the research, most, uh, the best opportunity for returns to the limited partners, those are the people who give us money, has existed when people have made seed investments over extended periods of time. In fact, the type of returns, the probability of getting a home run, the probability of, of looking at, at, at the ability to lever up dollars, which is really what you're investing in the early stage, comes from historically breakthrough technology inventions. So we started a relatively small fund by traditional Sand Hill Road venture capital standards of just under $60 million, but very large for a seed fund. Our initial investment to start is about $800,000, but we want to put almost four to five million to work over the life of a company. As the company looks to show continued progress, that allows us to also measure out our money and protect our interests over time. Uh, we're based in the Bay Area. I happen to reside in Orange County. I like to joke around that I'm bi-coastal going up and down between the coasts. And uh, we hit most of the major research institutions, the six institutions in Southern California from Santa Barbara down through San Diego, and then of course Cal, Stanford, et cetera. We invest companies in the IT space, material science, often to clean tech and life sciences. My background uh, joined Exceed two years ago. Uh, I'm the partner in our firm with operating experience. I ran large divisions for General Electric, and I worked at Intel. I started a company that I sold to Kodak, worked for a company that was spun out of Stanford University, so I was an executive on the other side, taking technology out of Stanford University and dealing with the Office of Technology Licensing. I think for us, what we see is a largely underserved opportunity by institutional investors. The quality of research going on in higher education in North America remains the best in the world. And it's gotten extremely interesting over the last five to seven years as you look at cross-departmental collaboration. Electrical engineering departments working with medical departments. You're seeing real breakthrough and real perspectives that just hadn't been happening for a while. We funded 14 companies in the last three years. Uh, our deal flow remains very, very high and very, very strong. The uh, challenges of the market over the last 18 months had absolutely zero impact on us on our deal flow. Where it did impact us is we had to be significantly more careful about the types of companies that are going to get funded downstream. So for us, the LPs, the limited partners, have the expectations for us that we're looking for big returns, a company that can get to 50 to $100 million a year in sales in a five to seven year time horizon. We needed to be cognizant of our brethren who do mid to later stage investing about what are going to be the types of things that they're going to be willing to fund and what are the things they wouldn't be willing to fund. And so for us, that's I think been the biggest change in the last 18 months is having to be aware of something that might be good research, it might be good technology, but what's going to be its likelihood of success depending on its capital needs and the ability for downstream investors to be willing to invest in it. So uh, one example of where this has become more challenging is getting a semiconductor company funded today is almost impossible. Um, regardless of the fact that manufacturing moved offshore over the last decade, you know, 15 years to you know, fabulous companies in Taiwan and now China, um, the amount of capital that's required to put into a semiconductor company uh, is almost prohibitive and the, the further downstream semiconductor companies just can't get funded today. So for us, we still see lots of good opportunities, but we've had to adjust our thinking about what we can and can't support on a go-forward basis. Um, 
we try to be on campus once every one to two months, meeting with faculty members. We try to partner with the technology licensing office. I don't ever want to be <clears throat> in a discussion where we're trying to take a company out, and the first time I've met somebody is over the, a table on a negotiation. So you know, Cheryl's actually met my family when they when I've been on campus here working, and my kids came and picked me up. They went over, and we you know actually got to meet them, and we try to become a part of the ecosystem in where we behave because for us, we're running a marathon and not a sprint. And if you look at the institutions that have been most successful in bringing out companies, that ecosystem took many, many, many years to evolve. And Santa Barbara is still in its really nascent and early stages, maybe entering early to mid-puberty versus the maturity level that's going to come from a place like an MIT or a Stanford or some of the other institutions who have been doing this for longer periods of time. Thanks, Rob. And Sanjeet, as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur who actually spun a company out, of a university. Can you just tell us a little bit first about your company and how you realized it was the right time and the right opportunity to move this technology from the academic realm to a startup company? Sure. Um, so my name is Sanjit. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of a company called Meraki. We're based in San Francisco. I'm down here for the day to meet you guys. Um, and uh, you know, I think as Adam was saying, we went through a number of steps to start the company. Um, I was an undergrad at Stanford, I was a grad student at MIT, so I was surrounded by entrepreneurial culture. And uh, one of the things I think I can say is that I was probably one of the most reluctant entrepreneurs of the bunch. Uh, going to school at Stanford as an undergrad in the boom, dot-com boom between 98 and 2002, everyone was starting a company. Actually, I, I believe in my dorm, I remember looking down the hall at one point and there were three dot-coms within just visual distance. Like you'd go to the dining hall and people were talking about business plans and were on the table getting smeared with food and stuff like that. And so that was the culture at Stanford. When I went to MIT, we were surrounded by uh, people who had started companies. Akamai was across the street. It seemed like actually every room that we went to was named after some company that had been started there. So you couldn't hide from the entrepreneurial culture. Um, for some context on Meraki, we're a wireless networking company. Uh, technology focused, we build products, we try to make it as easy and straightforward for people to build large wireless networks as possible. Um, we have customers that range uh, all the way from individuals essentially connecting their communities all the way up to some of the largest carriers in the world deploy us across entire countries. Uh, to give you an idea of where that technology came from, it's actually a PhD research project. So uh, personally, I went from undergrad to grad school basically to to almost hide from this entrepreneurial culture, which seemed very distracting. Everyone was starting a company on the drop of a hat. I wanted to build something significant, and I'm an engineer at heart. Uh, I like to build products, and so I went to grad school thinking this is a chance to actually build some new technology. Um, so before Meraki, there was a project called MIT RoofNet. I started grad school in about 2002, and uh, basically when I came in, my professor shared the same vision basically said, you know, actually don't work on anything specific, work on doing something significant. And what he meant by that is try to figure out a new way to build networks, try to do something ambitious, and along the way we'll make all sorts of discoveries, we can publish papers, and that'll be the significant contribution. That's where it started. Um, so we basically did that, we built a network. Um, we started out essentially trying to figure out a way to get broadband to grad students across Cambridge. Um, Partially for selfish reasons, we were really poor and didn't want to pay Comcast. Um, and so that's where the, the research started. Had a very practical flavor to it, but we were out there to essentially just try to develop new technology. It matured over time to the point where we actually were inventing new technology along the way to solve real problems. So we were trying to build this network in Cambridge, connect grad students across several square kilometers. We were trying to do it all wirelessly because we couldn't actually get wires from the city government. Uh, we didn't have mounting assets, so we had to figure out ways to give students radios to mount on their roofs. Um, and a lot of these students were math grad students, had, didn't have a practical bone in their body, and so we had to make it so the product just turned itself on. So all these little practical steps kind of came along the way. Um, and at one point, we realized we'd essentially been building a product. When we started grad school, these prototypes were contraptions. They were actually full Dell PCs uh, with hundreds of dollars of cabling and antennas and proprietary radios coming out of it. And I think the engineers and us essentially started refining it. Uh, we got it down from a Dell PC to a smaller PC, then to a single function board. 
by 2006, we'd basically gone from something that cost us $5,000 to prototype to something that cost us about $50 to prototype. And that's when it started to feel really disruptive. Um, so I, I know there were some references to MIT Sloan. Um, as part of our PhD requirement, we had to take uh, one or two classes that were outside of our discipline. And so my co-founder, John, and I uh, didn't like taking classes. And we figured out, we looked through the course catalog, we found the two courses that didn't require attendance. And so, uh, and they happen to be in the business school. So we thought this is great. This is the entrepreneurial tendency, right? Find the, find the simplest way to get to your goal. Um, so we took this course on, um, I forgot the title, but it was basically around disruptive uh, technologies. And it was, it was interesting to us. It was actually so interesting that we voluntarily attended the lectures, which is something I hadn't done for a long time. Um, and it, it made us realize that we had something truly disruptive on our hands. We were basically, building products that were able to go up against products from giants like Cisco Systems or Nortel or Juniper. Uh, we kind of built it in our backyard, in our basement and in our lab, and uh, realized we need to take this to market. And so that's kind of where the seed was planted. Um, a lot of fortuitous things happened. Um, we ended up landing our first customer before we were even incorporated. It happened to be Google. Uh, they, they heard about our technology and thought it was really interesting and basically said, well, we'll pay you for a thousand. He said, a thousand what? So I'm like, whatever, we'll pay you for a thousand. And so <laughs> only Google does things like that. But it was, it was a great sort of stepping stone for us. It let us bootstrap the company. Um, the one condition they had was that we had to come from Cambridge to um, Mountain View to spend the summer there working with them on this product that hadn't been invented yet. Um, we thought that was a good deal. And we were kind of hesitant. We'd, we basically established home base in Cambridge. We were working with a bunch of our grad student friends. And finally, they offered us a bunch of free food. And we said, OK, we'll do it. Um, so we came out to Mountain View. And I think that's when the company really started. That's when it went from being a technology in a lab to being a product, to being a company, to being something we were selling to customers. And something we did very early on is um, rather than put together a business plan, Google paid us some money for our initial products. We just kind of funneled that right back in and started selling product and in engaging with customers, and it just kind of grew organically from there. Uh, so that was 2006. Uh, I think in the first, we started shipping a product three months after we were founded. Um, by the end of the year, we'd shipped into probably a couple of dozen customers. And then it started to really take off. In 2007, we, we started having a world map in our office because our shipping intern was having trouble remembering where all we'd ship products to. And so we had little pins. We were in 12 or 13 countries, and then it grew. Uh, it's 2010 now, we're in about 143 countries. Uh, we have 14,000 customers. We've connected 5 million people wirelessly. So we've had the impact, and that was actually what drove us and fueled us in the beginning, is we said, we've got this disruptive technology, we can make an awesome product, and most importantly, we can have a dent on the kind of technology world. Um, so if you look at our engineering team today, it's actually, I think, uh, 60 or 70% MIT grads. Um, and a pretty significant number of them to the point where I was asked not to come back to visit the computer science department at least for five years so they can grow a new crop, is what the <laughs> lab director told me. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I think what motivated me and what motivated my co-founders was exactly that. Let's build something cool. Let's go have an impact. Um, I think uh, Lita said in her presentation that the financial impact was actually secondary to us. We wanted to do something really impressive and really amazing. Um, and then since then, we've. We've raised money, Sequoia Capital, Google, a bunch of famous people have invested in the company. The business is doing really well, but I think that technology transfer from the university um, into industry is what made Meraki possible. This is not something that could have formed as an undergrad. It's not an idea that would have formed around a breakfast table. It's because of MIT. It's because we had four years of just building technology and exploring. And it was really that journey that was a reward. We actually don't use much of the technology that we developed when we were in grad school, we've since developed our own technology, but I think we learned how to think differently when we were in grad school, and that was the really big impact. Um, and these days, I recommend to everyone that's in grad school, you know, stay there until it's irresistible, and then go start a company. Um, and MIT actually makes it really easy. I think I have 21 years remaining to go back. So if we can't make Meraki successful in 21 years, I'll go back to grad school. Uh, so that's right. my intro. Thanks. Just to follow up really quickly, you mentioned um, Google as one of your first customers, if not your first customer, they're also an investor, yep. as well as Sequoia. Can you just give us some perspective on how 
um, getting the company capitalized worked? I know that's a, a big obst obstacle for a lot of uh, startups and university-based startups. Yeah, and you know, I think it's uh, it happens in a flash almost, and so it's it's kind of no surprise there's not a lot of information about how it happens. Um, I think it's also unique for most companies. The Meraki story is because we were able to bootstrap at the beginning, we actually were able to defer the whole process of raising capital for a while. Um, we didn't even raise angel capital until we'd started shipping our product. And at that point, we, we realized, well, we actually have eight or 10 people working for us. And if we don't make any money, it's OK, because we were grad students. We were used to actually, I think you're actually below the poverty line when you're in grad school. So <laughs> you develop a thick skin. But we had hired some people, and we started to feel that we were taking on a risk. And so that's when we raised money. Um, that was from the angels. Google was an angel. Google Incorporated was an angel investor in the company. That's how they got involved. Um, we started working with Sequoia that December. And uh, the reason for that was it was actually accidental. One of our angel investors was a professor at Stanford. He happened to be uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin's advisor, PhD advisor. And of course, he was well connected in the community. I think he'd mentioned Meraki to a partner at Sequoia. And those guys are aggressive. Uh, so they hunted us down, basically, uh, to the point where they're calling our cell phones, calling our parents' cell phones, just trying to figure out a way to talk to us. Uh, we, we had a conversation with them, and, and they said, look, you know, this is really exciting. Um, and, and so then we found ourselves raising money. We didn't need it. We actually hadn't even touched any of the angel money that we'd raised. And so we basically went back to them saying, we don't really need your money. And they said, you need our money. Uh, <laughs> and so that was kind of the initial conversation. Um, we, we, we decided to learn about it really fast. I think as a bunch of engineers, we just went into sponge mode, talked to everyone we could, read every scrap of literature we could about raising money, uh, raised a $5 million Series A in about six days. Um, and then we did a $20 million Series B when we were really starting to accelerate, uh, which took three days and was an auction, uh, at the point where I had a conference call with eight venture capitalists who don't generally like talking to each other. And I just said, just say a number. And then if you don't have a number to say, stay quiet. Um, and that's an awesome position. I, I can't imagine too many companies. You know. <laughs> um, and, and it wasn't, and I think the whole time, we were the reluctant entrepreneurs in the whole thing. We were focused on building a product. We were focused on having an impact. Raising money is something you do along the way, no offense. Um, you know, it, it, and it's, it has a place. We needed that money. We couldn't have grown to the point where we are now without that money. Um, but staying focused on what you're actually trying to do, which is build the product and have an impact on the market, I think gets everyone excited. The investors understood we have a compass. These guys are on a mission. They're going to sell their product whether we're on board or not. And that changed everything. So we were able to raise money. We got awesome terms. We got great advisors. Uh, it was. Uh, I think a great way to kind of keep everything aligned. Uh, I think if we were focused on raising money, we would have probably come up with ideas that made the VCs happy, but maybe n wouldn't have made the market happy. And so this kind of keeps us true to our mission. Your fundraising story is uh, certain to make many want to be entrepreneurs jealous. <laughs> uh, it's also an interesting commentary on the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem that you're in, in the Bay Area and in Cambridge, that you can raise money if you have the right team and the right technology mm -hmm. without really trying. And you can do it very quickly. Yeah, and I think without trying is probably an overstatement. Um, the, what surprised me is that they trusted a 25-year-old with $25 million. I don't trust a 25-year-old with $25 million. <laughs> uh, and I think it was because we had a purpose with that money. Right. Well said. Um, now I'd like to open up to our panelists to um, ask our speakers any questions that they want to ask after the presentations, if they have any. I have a question for Lita, and I'm f familiar with the data out of Cal and Stanford, but as you look at the impact to the university, have you, has MIT studied what the impact has been on in terms of alumni who've been hired into companies that were founded by MIT uh, you know, graduates and their donations back to the university. Because one of the things that we found at Stanford was that, you know, when you get the big hit, what you get is a building donated by the founders and then the thousand people who went to work for Google, Yahoo, et cetera, that came out and there's that annual giving. I'm curious if you've been able to, to quantify the benefit back to the university based upon kind of that, the positive reinforcing circle that comes from uh, being part of the university ecosystem? 
I think donations from company, people who make a lot of money from the companies, it's more the donation to where they got their education, not where they licensed their technology out of. Um, it's more an emotional, you raised me, rather than you gave me good terms, so I'm going to give it back. There, there's a legend afoot, you know, give it to them cheap and then they'll donate back. It isn't how well, it The spirit happens. of my comment was more about the <laughs> alumni who took something out of the university and then started companies and the, they hired people, you know, your Oh, well, example, the hiring I people, I think we haven't kept track of that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's sort of, well, first of all, you know, it's those, it's, People tend to hire the people they know and the people of their own you know, culture, call it country or university. You know, you speak the same language and they tend to hire people. Um, so I think that's just a natural organic process. Um, we haven't thought in terms of creating employment for the grads because they don't really usually have a lot of trouble getting jobs. Uh, so I'm not sure that that, that that one is one that we've thought very much about. All right, well, I have a question for uh, Lita and Cheryl both. Uh, feel okay. free, either one of you, to jump in. So do people ever come into your office and say, I want to start a company. What do you have? And uh, what do you tell them when they come in? You want the, right answer, the real answer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please don't come. Um, the, it's a very poor way to find a an opportunity. If you come in with one of two things, either I'm trying to start a company and I'm looking and I have the technology and I'm looking for complementary technology, then we really want to see you. The other one is I really have experience in entrepreneurship in this domain space and do you happen to have something right now that you're matching me up with? But as for come look through our files and see if you can find yourself something to do, uh, it's a very, very poor thing to do. We do try to know people a lot because once in a while there'll be a serendipitous match. Somebody came in, you know, I'm, I'm nice to young alums or even not so young alums who are thinking about, so it was a social call, if you call it that, or, chat, or philanthropic call. But the guy says, you know, he's sold his company, he's looking for something else, he's, you know, familiar in the IT space, and then he said banking. I said, oh, you really need to go talk to Ron Rivest because there's this company, Peppercoin, starting up and really banking is where they're looking. And he said, oh, I know Ron. So that happened, but that's, that's more networking than it is come in and look for something. And I would uh, agree 100% with Lita. Um, we don't see a lot of deal traction if, if it's a random trip through our portfolio. What I always um, also would add to enhance what Lita said is, you know, if you look statistically, UCSP's portfolio, 611 active inventions, which is probably a lot smaller than MIT, but still fairly good for, for our university. The statistical chance that we are sitting on the perfect technology f that's right there, patent pending for you to take, is relatively small. What I suggest, if you really want to look at UCSP, I tend to link you with researchers that are looking in your space. Because if they're working in your space, they might not have told us yet that they have an interesting technology because they might not know it. One thing I try to keep in mind with faculty is at one point in their life they decided not to go into business. And there's a reason for that. So our best deals from sort of cold calls come from exactly uh, what Rob does. Can This is my space. Could you suggest some researchers to talk to and then come for the day and talk about the global research and then perhaps it'll focus down to a technology we know or don't know about that you are, we're thrilled when you find something that, that we don't know about, you know, that, that really can become a good opportunity. So I'd say for those of you looking at any university, look at the research first, the IP second. Also remember we have a drag of 
takes that they have to make it and then tell us about it. So there's a time lag if you come just to us. Thanks. That was Bob's characterization of them, yeah. Oh, that, that was your, that was your No, no, Bob Johnson. Oh. Uh, it was, it's not the decline, it's that generally the people who were angel investing without knowledge of the domain space in which they were investing were generally, they couldn't really bring anything except money to the deal. And often they were very disappointed because they didn't understand the time frames for development of technology. And the, the, uh, the summation of the question is just to explain the change in the angel investing environment. And are there more experienced angel investors now as opposed to investors uh, previously who just had a lot of money and wanted to throw it at a uh, startup company or dabble in angel investing? Well, the best way to make a knowledgeable uh, angel investor in the technology space is to create a good IPO market for him to sell his company and then start looking for something else to do. <laughs> that is, the, what we're talking about is angel investors who had themselves been in the industries to which they are, in which they are now investing. And that's a good segue for me to open it up to our audience. If you guys have any questions for the panel, feel free. So the question is, do the directors of the technology transfer offices have to push technology, or is it being pulled by companies? It's, if we're talking about really innovative technology as opposed to little things, it's pull, and it's pull from because, well, it's a little of both in the venture investing because we are fortunate enough to have enough friends in the venture community that we can call them up and say, hey, this one seems to fit what you guys like. You really ought to go talk to Professor X. So when that's the exception. Other than that, it's... Um, people who know the faculty, faculty know people. Cold calling on companies, existing companies, and saying, how would you like to uh, see this marvelous technology we have? Particularly in large companies, it's almost hopeless. Even if you do your homework and go to the right person in the right company, in the right technology with your beautifully packaged presentation of your invention, it's almost hopeless because the, the, in an established company, they, the, first of all, the risk is too high and the time to market's too long. But secondly, their R&D dance cards are full. They've already gone through the annual strategic uh, planning session in which 14 out of the 18 projects from their own R&D department got turned down. So four of them were prioritized. Now the last thing in the world they're going to do is take something into R&D from outside. And it's not so much not invented here as we know where we're going and you're coming in sideways with something we hadn't even thought about. It's a sort of the, the UCSB experience, you know, there is a, a little difference, um, obviously, in the popular knowledge of, of the two schools. Um, but we do both push and pull, um, perhaps maybe a little bit more uh, marketing than MIT because we are, let's say, new in the past eight to ten years as really having a, a presence um, internationally as a university. We've had a very sharp um, upward curve. Um, so we're not a household name that everyone knows well, about, well. but no, I mean, where I'm going with this is simply the ecosystem that MIT has of people interacting with their faculty and interacting with their office is a little different, which is fine. Um, but what I was going to say is, again, 
we do marketing to established companies, we certainly have a few deals a year that come from it. it we find it worthwhile to do some of. But again, the main connection is going to be the research. Most of our established companies come in because they're already aware of the professor's research. And what we're doing is facilitating an exploration of what they've perhaps monitoring and putting an intellectual property bow on it. Because um, she's right, you know, Intel's well, got their R&D. Mid-sized companies are a little more open to marketing. Small companies, little startups usually have their dance card very full. They're not really, unless there's an absolute fit, they're not really I think we're open. talking about two so. different things. That is, are we talking about uh, marketing a, a known invention out into the world, which I, what I, was what I was talking about, or are we talking about marketing research opportunities? There, I think you have to do more outreach marketing, but it ten, even then, there, it tends to be done by the faculty or the upper academic administration approaching the heads of the companies saying, we're forming this center or we're doing this thing, and that kind of marketing, I think. That's actually yeah. not, I was actually talking about, about the, actual the patents, and, and this is very much a UCSB-centric view. Again, going into statistics of that one IP being the one fit that that established company needs, we get enough either deal flow or awareness of UCSB technology that is worth doing some intellectual property marketing. But at the end of the day, it's the networks that we have, the networks our senior administration has. And like I said, the biggest success we have is when an established company comes to visit to learn the research then the follow-up questions on IP comes out, then you're going to get um, more of a chance of getting an IP fit. So that's kind of what I meant, is again, we look at the research yeah. as statistically providing um, a better chance of hitting. Mm -hmm. Once that hit's made, then we try to look into the IP from there. We do do the standard marketing out, because we get enough activity and we find enough good contacts that we can later use that, that we do find it worthwhile to have a marketer on it. But no, that's not the, by anywhere means the vast majority of our deals come from there. We, we do that for a variety of purposes. Um, but really, we just kind of take a global approach to for the companies. Yeah. It's really, both of us are talking about it. It's the relationships that the faculty have are probably the most critical. And then our office's relationships with some of the venture funds, but more conventional marketing, as again, I guess we're not, uh, it doesn't seem to yield us a hell of a lot. It's not the primary deal yeah. flow by any means. The question is for uh, Rob to describe XSEED's business model and if there are any other VC firms out there, investors out there, who have a similar model. So again, the premise of our kind of analysis is that you know, venture capitalists are simple creatures, right? We're kind of up there with paramecium and amoebas. Whether or not we are good at our job is strictly dependent upon our ability to give returns to the people who give us money. There might be VCs who are good people or bad people. That's true in everything in life. But fundamentally, that's how I'm judged. We believe that disproportionate returns will be generated for our limited partners by investing in breakthrough technologies, by getting in early, investing small amounts of money to de-risk a situation, looking at technical risk, market risk, and execution risk, setting specific milestones with our entrepreneurs to figure out what's that point that we can achieve knowing whether or not we've mitigated some of those risks, and funding to those milestones. And if we can keep a company focused and we can work with them, 
All of us have operating backgrounds. You know, I took a company public in the early 90s. I sold a company that I started. I ran big divisions of GE and Intel, right? I'm bald and I'm 24 years old, right? Because I pulled my hair out in previous lives. That's what we try to do. And we're often working with people who don't have business backgrounds. So our job is to try to help coach and guide them. We're not players anymore, we're coaches. And our job is to try to bring people into the ecosystem to help them be successful. Um, time will tell if we're gonna be successful on this, right? We kind of went counter cyclical to what the industry was doing. And we're only gonna know if we're good in this in about five or 10 years when if and then hopefully we've generated returns for our limited partners. We do see pockets of venture firms appearing in certain parts trying to do something similar to what we're doing. We tend to be a little bit larger than those funds. We're a $60 million fund. Again, large for a seed fund, but small for a traditional Sand Hill Road fund. Um, we often will find individual partners in the large partnerships who will do what we do, which enjoy hanging out with the scientists and like that early stage stuff and trying to see if there's something there and like to do the work that venture capital used to do, what Sequoia used to do when they were you know, 20, 30 years ago before they became what Sequoia is. Um, time will tell if this is gonna work. I think what is gonna change Davis in the, in the venture business is that in the next three years, the shakeout that should have happened a decade ago is gonna happen now. Um, and that's because the traditional sources of capital for the venture industry are basically saying no more. Right, so the university endowments, no more. Right, they, the, the venture industry has not returned money to the limited partners for a decade. So you know, it's a long time to take a lot of capital and not give money back to your LPs. So I think what's gonna end up happening is you'll have the, a few big gorillas at the top, the Sequoias, the NEAs, the Oaks, the Kleiners, the Vinodes, you know, the Coastal Ventures, you know, a few of the ones who've been around for a long time and will continue to be successful. I think you're gonna see, we think you're gonna see the whole kind of lower end of the top tier and the middle tier get wiped out. And some of them will reinvent themselves and will come back as smaller funds, individual partners who kind of want to go back to doing smaller things. And we think the industry will end up coming back to us. Some will focus on science like we do. Some will focus on capital efficient plays in IT, which sometimes don't need as much capital. Um, but you know, we see generally individual partners. We don't see full partnerships. We do see types of partnerships who like technologically hard things, and some that don't. So those are the ones that we tend to partner with and work with over time. In the back. Good question. The question is, if you're a UCSB professor, how do they work with the tech transfer office to commercialize their technology? Well, the first thing we advise them is to please get some business representation and business skills. Um, we avoid, like, the plague. Um, sitting on the other side of the table uh, negotiating against our own faculty. There are some policies in effect, but it's just not a good thing to do. It's kind of like negotiating <clears throat> against your you know, brother or sister. Um, and um, they honestly, some of our, our faculty are very savvy and experienced in business. Some of them come from business. Many of them don't. So the first thing we tell them is, you know, get some business expertise, and we do try to help when we can. What we do do at UCSB that is, seems to be a little different is we do have a standard two-page, what we call a letter of intent. Um, that, that is a, a mechanism that a lot of universities use. We do have a standardized um, arrangement for the first year of a faculty startup um, that has a, a very low standard fee patent cost reimbursement, two page, and you, you know, we sort of affectionately call it the, you know, the blue plate special. The reason we do that is we don't want the perception that we're being harder on one faculty than the other. We want to be able to put something in place very quickly and we want it to be low value enough that the faculty member can afford to have it to give them time to really decide do they want to form a company, to really find that business expertise, to maybe talk to Rob and a couple others. This is even a fundable, fundable idea. Because our hope is at the end of this very low level engagement, they'll be able to make a decision. Yes, I'm gonna make a company, I think I can make it go. Or you know what, it, you know, maybe not the best idea. So those are the two things we do. First, we try to, you know, we try to kind of nurture them as they go along the whole process. I think the key thing for a faculty, and to be honest, in a place like Santa Barbara, it can be challenging. It's expensive to live here 
you know, is getting access to the right um, business people with the right skills to complement um, their technology expertise. If they can do that, they usually have a really um, good shot at, at seeing where it goes. I'd say four things come to mind. The first is disclose and go to their office early. And, and I say that, I'd say this even if Cheryl Adam weren't here, because... We'll, you, we'll pay you $20 uh, after you, the show. It's, you know, it's all part of the ecosystem. And you're gonna, working the system makes everything a whole lot easier because you don't ever want to have this thing where somebody feels like they're going around their backs later, just not worth the pain. And UCSB is actually you're pretty lucky. Not all of the UC campuses are as um, evolved in their evolutionary thought process since the IP came out of the president's office. UCSB gets it. There's a pretty good ecosystem, even if it's for the small community that Santa Barbara is, it's pretty evolved in its thinking. So I, you know, kind of be open kimono there is, is, is my advice and, and do it the right way. So that's the first one. Um, I'd say the other thing is, is there was a great expression that was used in Lita's speech that I liked a lot, which they talked about trying to get mentors to help the faculty members. And that's very different than trying to find a business entrepreneur to pair up with a faculty member. And the reason is sometimes people in the community, maybe they've made their money, maybe they're a mid to senior level manager and they're just looking for something to do, but they're not really entrepreneurs. So make sure you know the difference between somebody who you're gonna partner with and is gonna help you build a company versus somebody who's gonna be your mentor. Um, because as a, as a venture capitalist, I'm gonna be looking at the team that I'm giving my money to. And if I love you, but don't like the person you've partnered with, it's gonna be hard for me to fund. But if you can surround yourself with really smart people who've been through the wars before and will help you, that's a great thing. They'll tell you how to negotiate with them, they'll tell you how to negotiate with me, and they'll generally give you good advice. And I'd say the last thing is spend some time knowing in your own mind what do you want to do personally. Do you really want to go start a company? Do you want to take a leave of absence and try it? Do you want to do your one day a week consulting about it? Try to have that self-awareness so that you know going in, what do you hope to get out of this process? Are you trying to make money? Nothing wrong with that. Are you trying to get your invention out there to have an impact on the world? But be able to say that to yourself real clearly and succinctly. Because if you know that, it'll be a whole lot easier as you go through the process knowing what you hope to get out of it. And, and th then you can kind of hold on to that and it'll kind of be your North Star as you navigate through the ups and downs of starting a company. So the question is, how, how do we find the mentors and the resources and the investors uh, in this area in Southern California that are so prevalent in Cambridge or the Bay Area? I want to highlight that I was jealous of this story as well on raising money <laughs> because let's be clear. I, I was an executive and an entrepreneur substantially longer than I've been a venture capitalist. And having literally raised tens of millions of dollars, I never had an experience like that. Um, and so, you know, congratulations. I mean, that's awesome. More power to you. Um, but even in the Bay Area, that's the anomaly. That's not what happens. It, it is so far of an outlier of what the experience is like. Um, we should be happy for our, our colleague and friend here um, but that's not what it's like. It's hard everywhere. And most things will fail. Um, you know, I think that, that in turn, the, Santa Barbara, I think, does a much better job than even like Orange County, where I live, the greater Los Angeles area, even San Diego. I think there's a, there's a focus here for these types of events that, that, you know, you see all the same, a lot of the same faces. It's very supportive of the community. Uh, and so I think keep doing kind of more of what you're already doing. The biggest challenge I think for Santa Barbara as an area is not just so much the cost of living, but it's a hard, you know, it's hard to get critical mass in an ecosystem of accountants, lawyers, venture capitalists, and people to hire. And that, that's a big thing. The other thing different, I think, Bay Area versus Southern California, look at Ventura County South, is the Bay Area is really highly concentrated. I mean, you've got a few major universities that are all very close and, and people are remarkably similar, right? Their cohort groups look alike. Southern California is very geographically dispersed. It's, there's a, a broader base of different industries and so it's, it's spread out. If I want to get in my car, it's a 
two and a half hour drive to get up here with no traffic. It's a solid 90 plus minutes to San Diego if I want to get to kind of you know, downtown San Diego. And yet in the Bay Area, you know, you basically I can circle the Bay two and a half times almost to that, even with Bay Area traffic. So there's, the, the, you know, you look at, at Cambridge, right? There's, a, there's just walk. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> the, the density of that is, you know, and, and by the way, we go look through history. Look at what happened in Florence and other cities where you had critical mass of flowering things, high geographic concentrations. There's something to that. Um, and I think so, so what you can do is continue to do the things you're doing. You have to work extra hard to overcome the, some of those challenges uh, and also be cognizant of where of what are those specialty areas where somebody can play. I think the university here has done a good job of looking at the solid state, you know, the energy efficiency and solid state lighting as a, an area of a center of excellence and focus in on those things. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the only thing that really that I can suggest that, that uh, but don't quit. You know, begin, you, this, is, this is all just starting here. It's all just starting, so it's going to be hard, but just don't give up. Don't ever give up. Um, but it may be your children that actually get the most benefit out of it. <laughs> you know? If I could put a, just a little bit of a person who lives here, local spin. Um, one of the advantages uh, Santa Barbara has is we all talk about how it operates like a small town. It's everyone so friendly here. Lita is probably shocked in her time here that no one honked their horn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it really, but you know, that culture, what I find is in the entrepreneurs too. So one thing that I tell faculty who is starting the journey is, you know, if you can find some company or some entrepreneurs that are working in the space you're going in already, or just have a lot of experience, ask them to coffee, because what I found, is particularly in the Santa Barbara environment, is there really is a grassroots support. Like if you look at UCSB, the first entrepreneurs, when I send faculty to other faculty that have been successful, they really do open up the Rolodexes here and take a little time. So that's another thing to think about where we can take advantage of our small town attitude if you can find some sort of market experts or some, some business people in your area that are maybe a little farther along than you you know, and, and see if they can, can help you, because we've seen a lot of success at UCSB, you know, with that style of interaction. Can I add one thing? Um, I guess just two cents that kind of occurred to me is most successful companies on this planet were not founded by MIT or Stanford people, or people <laughs> that were backed by Google or Sequoia or whatever. And, you know, I think here we're looking at some successful data points. You've got Lita talking about how much wealth and success MIT has created. But the reality is most successful businesses are created by just stock entrepreneurs who see an opportunity, go after it, pursue it, fail, try again. And I think we've gotten very, very, very lucky. Uh, we are the outlier. We see that we're Six Sigma out. And we're, we're, we feel very fortunate. We also know that there's still a lot of risk ahead. Um, but I think as an entrepreneur, you see people just taking risk. You know, Michael Dell didn't go to any of these places, right? He just started a computer company in his dorm room. Um, so it, it seems like it certainly can be done. And it, it, from my perspective, I get inspired by stories of people that do start companies just from scratch. Um, because you can kind of get lulled into thinking that if I get all these right people to advise me and I get all the right money and all these brand names, that I'll be successful. But I don't think that's the case. Like, you have to work really hard no matter what. That's just my perspective. That's a good reality check. Sure. The question is, how did Google find you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they were watching our searches, I guess. I'm not really sure. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> uh, I, I think the way that Google found us, um, Google, at least at that time in 2006, still maintained very close ties to the academic community. Um, a lot of people from our lab had gone there. And so uh, in general, they're looking for talent. They're always trying to recruit the PhD students and hire them away. And sometimes they see a project that's just interesting. and it, in, it's in Google's best interest to have more broadband access, more internet access, especially wireless. You guys have probably seen the Nexus One Google phone and so on. Uh, so I think all of those ideas were germinating in Google at the time, and they realized an investment in wireless would be really interesting. Um, I can't really say specifically how they found us, but they did invite me to come out and give an academic talk, and that's when they had the, the conversation with me, is after the talk, they said, okay, this research looks really good. It sounds like you can make a product you know, let's, let's figure out how to make that happen. Um, so I think Google has kind of mastered the art of taking a very forward-thinking tech, technical 
idea or technology and then figuring out how do you actually go put it out there. All right, I'd like to thank our speakers and panelists for a great program tonight. Special thanks to Lita Nelson for coming all the way from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Santa Barbara, even in this weather. Our panelists are also from out of town, so thank you for making the trip as well.